Arthur Hacker was not one to limit himself to any one type of production, has always been an agreeable characteristic of Mr. Hacker's practice as an artist. His career has been one of wholesome experiments and has been marked by many changes in his mode of dealing with artistic problems, but it has been full, also, of eminently memorable achievement, and it has been distinguished quite definitely in all its phases. He has never allowed the individuality of his work to become stereotyped or to degenerate into mannerism, and he has never been tempted to give way to that habit of repetition which is so often the consequence of success. Yet success came to Mr Hacker earlier than it does to most painters, and he had taken a definite place at an age when most men are still struggling for the first signs of recognition. He was born in 1858. His father was a line engraver, and in 1876 he began a period of four years' study in the Royal Academy schools, where he found himself in competition with an unusually strong group of fellow students, among them men who have since established themselves in the front rank of modern British art, like Mr Stanhope Forbes, Mr Solomon J. Solomon, Mr H. H. Lathang, Mr Melton Fisher, Mr Sterling Lee, and Sir E. A. Waterlow. These surroundings, perhaps, stimulated him to keener effort. For when he left the academy to enter Bonnat's atelier in Paris, he had to his credit many successes as a prize winner in the schools, and he had commenced, at the age of 19, that career as an exhibitor at Burlington House, which has continued without a break to the present day. The years he spent abroad had unquestionably a momentous influence on his later practice. Not only did he profit from the teaching in Bonnet's studio which lasted for two years, but he profited from the inspiring cultural surroundings in which he found himself, and he took the opportunity to travel to other countries. In Paris, he went with his friend Solomon J. Solomon, on a tour through Spain to Madrid, where he lingered for a while studying the works of the great Spanish masters, and then on through Seville and the coast towns of Spain to Gibraltar, whence he crossed to Tangier. This tour occupied altogether five months, and it added greatly to the store of impressions that was to serve in years to come as the foundation of his best production. It was not his only trip through countries that appeal vividly to a painter's fancy. There were subsequent occasions on which he visited Morocco, and even more remote districts of northern Africa, and wandered south, almost to the borders of the Sahara. Hacker had begun with the domestic genre, with pictures of softer sentiment, and during the early 80s, these occupied him almost entirely. But towards the end of the 80s, the effect of his study of the light and colour of North Africa began to be perceptible in his pictures. He painted little, which actually represented life in that part of the world, but he completely changed the motives of his work, and he changed also the quality of his colour and tone. His canvases became more luminous, more delicate, and more subtly harmonised, without at the same time losing any of the strength of statement which distinguished his earlier productions. Indeed, with the expanding of his ambitions and with the enlarging of the boundaries of his practice came a surer grasp of artistic essentials and a fuller recognition of his responsibilities as a craftsman. The picture that marked most definitely the alteration in his point of view was the Pelagia and Philammon, his first serious painting of the nude figure, it had a marked degree of originality, and it was singularly successful in its management of subtle tones of gentle, cool silvery colour, and in its splendidly confident draughtsmanship. Another and even more important figure composition, the Ve Victis, or the Sack of Morocco, which appeared in 1890, it is a large and impressive canvas measuring 64 by 106 inches and has all the elements an artist could wish to conjure up to put into a work of art. 
It is imposing and heroic in tone and design. All the parts are carefully thought out and a treat to behold as to every part and detail. Artists long to put to canvas their wide-ranging skills as their practice has acquired over time becoming second nature and the overflow of inspiration is put to pictures. After that larger canvas, Hacker presents us with two religious works featuring the dramatic portrayal in 1891 of the subject Christ and Mary Magdalene, in which Mary was ever grateful for the casting out of demons and thereafter devoting a life of devotion to her Lord. Then, in 1892, there is another picture of similar class, titled The Annunciation, which was bought by the Chantre Fund trustees. His work never rested upon a devotion to one genre as can be seen, but his instincts led him to cover any number of paths to satisfy his hunger to express his talent in a variety of ways, never limited and which was unquestionably relentless. In 1893 we find the painting or Circe, an imaginative picture treated with memorable power and matured technical skill. He had by now established beyond the possibility of doubt his claim to attention, so his election as an associate of the Royal Academy in 1894 came more or less as a matter of course. Certainly it was a thoroughly well-deserved honour earned by the consistent merit of his achievement during the previous 15 or 16 years. During the following years he launched out in another direction and sought his inspiration in pastoral life and in the strange effects of light and atmosphere which are to be found in several works. In his pastorals, paintings he has realised with unusual sensitiveness certain poetic aspects of rustic life, and has used them as material for pictures which, without ignoring the necessary facts of the subject chosen, give an abstract suggestion of reality that avoids very happily any hint of the commonplace. They are admirable impressions set down with just the right touch of intangibility and made convincing by their freedom from wiles of handling. They are tone and colour arrangements studied with unusual care and with a sincere intention to secure certain qualities of interpretation which will increase the significance of his rendering of the selected subject. These paintings of domestic life are entitled to their own particular thought in any summary of his achievement, because they illustrate so well his capacity for bringing out the more poetic aspects of the factual aspects he is dealing with. Among the men who have painted in England, Mr Hacker has already made for himself a place of high distinction by the judgment with which he has grasped the possibilities of familiar and everyday scenes, and by the skill with which he has turned them to pictorial account, that he reckons this branch of his practice as expressive of the best qualities of his art seems to be implied by his selection of one of his works for consideration when he was promoted to the rank of Royal Academician in 1910. In noting the variety of Mr Hacker's accomplishments and the many successes of his career, the importance of his work as a portrait painter must by no means be overlooked. The list of notable portraits for which he has been responsible is a very long one, and it covers practically the whole term of years during which he has been at work. If he had done nothing else, indeed, he would still rank among our more prominent artists, for in portraiture he is a man of very definite mark, has a strong appreciation of character, and he has, too, a sense of elegant arrangement which is always excellently displayed in his paintings of feminine sitters. The strength and grace of his portraits can be sincerely commended, and in the admirable painting of his mother. There exists a rare sympathy with his subject, and a masterly statement which carries the completest conviction. It is, in fact, this combination of sympathy and reserve that gives to all phases of his art their characteristic atmosphere. In a critical review of Mr Hacker's work is the following. 
whatever may be the direction in which he has turned for the moment, whatever may be the aesthetic experiment which he happens to be working out, he never fails to bring into operation the peculiarities of his own temperament, or to give full scope to the activity of his personality. That this personality is, in a sense, a restless one, is decidedly fortunate for restlessness when it is directed, as it is in his case, by fine taste and trained intelligence, makes for a valuable variety of achievement and produces results which are wholly worthy of acceptance by the world of art. As has been seen, it is quite obvious that Hacker was not one to be tied down to any particular genre, but chose to paint subjects that inspired him. He easily alternates between portraiture to everyday life to the nude, as he becomes more involved regarding possibilities in picture-making, often searching for a title to add to the studio model's gestures. As most artists are aware, it is the quest to continue to use the creative processes and exercise the endless possibilities of design. Studio work that is at times confining will give way to a sudden burst of inspiration to seize the paint box and depart to nature, freshening up the mind with its all-pervading assault on the senses. Carolus Duran, in his well-attended atelier, would often urge his pupils to take up a bouquet of flowers, place them in some careful arrangement, and paint in order to alleviate the exacting and difficult task of portrait painting. It is a chance to venture out and be free in one's approach to where experimentation is welcomed. In Arthur Hacker's painting of 1896 titled The Cloister of the World, we have an angelic host surrounding a woman kneeling enraptured to a vision. The work has a lovely and stark viewpoint, the gleaming white of the head veil, along with the upward movement of the thin tree, aids the impression he wants to convey. The topic presents a comparative approach to the role of women in religious and monastic life in Europe and the Americas during the medieval times. It must have been a stirring subject for Hacker to paint. In a similar manner, there is the painting Home from the Fields, suggestive of the weariness of a long day at work and children with father very tenderly returning home. The realism is suggestive of the French naturalist movement that became the popular theme in the day. It has a riveting realism and one that touches the heartstrings not merely as a cover but the paint handling that accompanies the theme is so well rendered. Then there is the painting of a young woman sitting in the fields of flowering plants with a much lighter key and colouring, the soft glow of the whites framing the composition smartly contrasted by her darkened features and hat. The plain air works of Hacker from nature, or the more imaginative figure paintings using nature as a backdrop, are for him an exercise in being free from repetition or conformity to a format. William H. Ward writes in his assessment of Hacker in 1896, Mr. Hacker holds that it matters little what may be the method of work or the subject of a picture, provided it is worth the painting from an artistic point of view, or that there is inherent in its composition that touch of nature which makes the whole world kin. In his own pictures, this last is seldom, if ever, wanting. Like most artists, Mr. Hacker looks forward to the time when he shall do something far in advance of what he has yet achieved. He cannot be accused of painting in a groove, for he is versatile in his works, but if sincere and earnest striving after something better, if determination in tackling the difficulties he meets within, his explorations into the different branches of his art should help him. He ought to emerge triumphant, for he has the courage to dare and the entire command of his weapons. In doing research for Mr Hacker and wanting to locate more of his works, we discovered a few black and white images that are interesting. One is of his studio showing the interior room with scattered artworks in progress, 
and another image is of the portrait of his mother, with her smart and intelligent features that he portrays so well. Then there is the woman looking at a print, or maud, really well done. Lastly, we have two interesting portraits of women, one a sympathetic portrait of a lady posed in the studio, and the other canvas of a woman ready to venture out with a hat and muffler in pastel. Hacker easily tackles all situations with a steady hand and technique. And finally, a portrait of Michael Tomkinson. A nicely rendered portrait, a well-placed and animated composition. We want to thank our subscribers, and if you haven't already, please consider. And if you will, add a like so the channel can grow. We hope you enjoyed the work of Arthur Hacker and our presentation. Until next time, bye for now.